Introducing Pitfall, the jungle adventure video game from Activision. Just a reminder, not everyone wins. Pitfall, the Mayan adventure for Sega Genesis and Super NES. Now, this is a game you may not have expected to see on DF Retro, but let me tell you, Pitfall, the Mayan adventure is a special little title from a unique time in the game industry that's well worth checking out today. In many ways, it's the equivalent of the modern day reboot. The Mayan adventure is to Pitfall, as Tomb Raider 2013 is to Core Design's 1996 original. This is a game that aims to deliver feature film quality animation with fast paced action while still giving a nod to the classic original. It was also released during a time when multi-platform gaming was at its most interesting. With so many different platforms on the market, ports were often developed by different teams, with each iteration offering its own unique vision. So today we're going to examine why I still feel that Pitfall the Mayan Adventure is a special game while checking it out across every platform including the Mega Drive, Mega CD, Atari Jaguar, 32X and more. So let's get started. Created by David Crane in 1982, the original Pitfall is a key title for the video game industry. You see, Pitfall was one of the pioneers in the side-scrolling platform genre. It does not feature scrolling, of course, but it does offer many of the elements which would come to define the genre in time. It was a huge hit and helped propel Activision, the world's first third-party publisher, to success. The series received a sequel and many ports before going silent for nearly a decade. During its absence, the platform game became arguably the most popular style of game available on home consoles. By the time we reached the middle of the 16-bit console wars, Mario and Sonic were household names. Activision also underwent a massive change during this era. Activision struggled to find its place in the late 80s and pulled all of its brands under the Mediagenic label before eventually posting a loss of almost $27 million in 1992. The company was basically bailed out by one Robert Kotick. Good old Bobby Kotick bought the company, restored the Activision name, which still had value, paid its debts, moved the whole thing to Los Angeles, and rebuilt it from scratch. Its first big moves came in the form of revivals, Games such as MechWarrior 2 and Return to Zork were huge on the PC side, capitalizing on prior successes. This same approach was applied to Pitfall on the consoles. And it wasn't alone. Activision also started versions of River Raid and Kaboom, both of which were cancelled. Pitfall, however, went into full development. And like MechWarrior 2 and Return to Zork, this new title was designed to capitalize on the Pitfall brand while introducing the world to new players. This rebirth of Activision was focused on pushing new technology barriers, 3D polygons on the PC, and in the case of Pitfall, hand-drawn animation. You see, it was during this console generation that developers started to really experiment with digitizing assets to use within games. We saw this with Mortal Kombat, which presented huge sprites created from digitized actors. More relevant to Pitfall, however, is Disney's Aladdin for the Sega Genesis. This game floored everyone at the time. The team at Virgin worked with real Disney animators to digitize beautiful drawings into what amounts to pixel art that could work within a video game, and it was brilliant. Aladdin features smooth feature film quality animation and richly detailed backgrounds to go along with it. Now, there's very little information on the development of Pitfall itself, but it's easy to imagine that the team was inspired by Virgin's work on Aladdin. The Mayan Adventure is interesting then. This is a sequel to the godfather of platform games developed during a very different era. This new game would need to channel elements of the classic while offering lavish production values and new gameplay mechanics. And I think they nailed it. Visually, the Mayan Adventure takes an approach similar to Disney's Aladdin, but it didn't start that way. More than a year prior to release, Activision presented the game as Pitfall Harry, the Mayan Adventure, intended for release in winter 1993 on Super NES. Based on these super early shots, it's fair to say that this was a completely different game, with this brochure proudly proclaiming things like 32 levels of action and features such as underwater breathing, something you would not encounter in the final game. More importantly, notice how the animation work isn't mentioned anywhere on this pamphlet, 
To me, this suggests that something significant changed during development, and I believe that something is the collaboration with Croyer Films, the animation studio responsible for the 1992 film Ferngali, The Last Rainforest. That's right, Activision brought in the talents of a major animation studio to help shape the look of the game, and I believe it was this decision that pushed the release date back by one year while completely transforming the visual design. I'd imagine the process here is like that of Aladdin. Croyer produces hand-drawn images, which are then digitized into a format that can be used on a computer. From there, these images are compressed to use as few colors and frames of animation as possible to fit within the constraints of the consoles while still offering the desired fluidity. Finding the right balance is difficult though, and I feel the team did an exceptional job in creating the sprites and background tiles featured within the game. Pitfall also features a lavish soundtrack, at least in some forms. The music created initially for the Sega CD version of the game was produced by Sound Deluxe Media Labs. This now defunct company was formed in 1992 and provided services to the film and game industry alike, a company Activision would employ for many other high profile projects such as MechWarrior 2. Pitfall the Mayan Adventure was one of its first projects though and the CD soundtrack they produced is truly outstanding even today, with a nice mix of jungle beats and foreboding tracks spread across the disc. The CD version even provides the option to listen to ambient sound effects instead of music if you desire. Then there's the game itself. Pitfall is a straightforward platform action game. You have a basic attack, three sub weapons, and a jump. It borrows several elements from the original Pitfall, such as pits, swinging vines, and crocodiles, but the gameplay ultimately shares very little with David Crane's original creation. What I love about Pitfall though is the feel of play in the game, the precision required and the level design combined together to create something truly magical. Stages are focused on fast navigation and platforming with some light puzzles to solve along the way. There's plenty of variety here too. One stage has you climbing the rocks around a waterfall as you make your way to the top. Another has you infiltrating a temple with some crazy jumps, while yet another features a pseudo minecart style level because, you know, it's the 90s and you gotta have a minecart in there. It's a fairly challenging game at first, but once you become accustomed to its style of play, everything just starts to click. It's a game I regularly pop in and play when I need some quick action. It's not as tight as the best Japanese games from this era, mind you, but I feel it's one of the best Western platform games of this time period, right up there with the likes of Earthworm Jim and Donkey Kong Country. That's not to say it's without flaw. Some players have issues with the controls, which prioritize animation when performing certain actions. But really, compared to modern games, it still feels rather snappy, just maybe not to the degree of its peers at the time. When you want to turn around quickly while running, for instance, there's a slight delay as a result of the animation, kinda like flashback. I like the way it feels, but it's not for everyone. How much you enjoy Pitfall, though, has a lot to do with which platform you play it on. This is a massively multi-platform game with seven unique versions all created by different teams with various strengths and weaknesses. 1994 saw the initial release of the game on Super NES, Sega Genesis, and Sega CD in North America. I'm going to be using the North American term since that's where I played it first, but it also showed up on the Mega Drive and the Mega CD. Information is sparse, but from what I can tell, the lead platform for this project was in fact Sega's 16-bit machine, and by extension, the Sega CD. Redline Games assisted with the Super NES conversion then. What we're left with is basically the same game, but there are some noticeable differences. Let's start with the basics for each version. On Sega Genesis, Pitfall is designed around the system's 320x224 output resolution. It's a fast-paced game running at 60 frames per second with no slowdown to speak of, but the artwork shows plenty of dithering as a result of the limited color palette and aesthetic choices made during development. And of course, it looks identical on Sega CD. Over on Super NES though, the system's lower resolution output of 256 by 224 means everything is slightly stretched and the viewing area is restricted. 
changes were made to the art and animation, but it features a few extra tricks as well. So how does this play out in practice then? Firstly, the palette between the two differs noticeably. It appears slightly grainier on the Sega machine, with differing hues and shading between different areas. Despite this, I like the way both versions look. The tile and sprite work between them then is very similar, with the Super NES version featuring some softer shading, as was common for the system. In this very first scene, for instance, we notice one of the major differences, the parallax background layer. These are hugely modified across the run of the game on Super NES, and all of them are missing animation. In this first stage, for instance, the artists simulate the appearance of rippling water with reflections in the background. On Super NES, this is obscured from view because the area representing the water is static. There is no animation. And the same goes for the water here and the floor in this stage. Nicely animated on Sega, but completely static on Super NES. Or how about the clouds in this stage? While slightly grainier, they do at least scroll on the Genesis versus the static Super NES backgrounds. Curiously, there is one exception to this with an extra layer of parallax featured exclusively in the mine stages. But honestly, it looks like floating chunks of rock, so I'm not really sure it works, though I really do like the color palette selected for the Super NES version in this stage. Animation is also reduced in certain scenes. When Harry Jr. rides a minecart, for instance, fewer frames of animation are used on Super NES compared to Genesis. Notice how his arms sort of twirl around on the Sega machine while he just sort of rocks back and forth on Super Nintendo. There is one stage, though, with animation on Super NES, and it's this. Two different implementations of the same waterfall. Which one do you guys prefer? I kind of like the Sega version myself. On the flip side, one advantage in favor of Super NES is visible in this stage. Color math is used to give the impression of a glow around your character. It's basically a gradient made to appear transparent applied across the entire screen. And it looks really nice, I think, and wouldn't have been possible on the Genesis. Now, I mentioned this earlier, and you may have noticed it by now, but the art was designed for 320-width pixel displays. So on the Super NES, where it's 256 pixels wide, everything appears slightly stretched, lending the game a wider look, but with a reduced field of view. Basically, when working with 8x8 pixel tiles, the Genesis version can fit 40 tiles horizontally across the screen, while Super NES can only display 32. So, screen real estate is reduced by 8 tiles. The minecart here, for instance, is fully visible on the Genesis, but mostly cropped on Super NES. This is a common problem for Genesis to Super NES ports, though, but I really feel it sticks out here. This, of course, also causes the camera to pan around more frequently, making it more difficult to hit certain jumps. Beyond that, the gameplay speed itself also varies. The game plays slightly faster on Super NES, lending it a twitchier feel. Certain animations complete faster on Genesis, but things like running and jumping are quicker on the Super NES. The control in general just isn't as refined as the Sega version, outside of the additional shortcut buttons for secondary weapons, of course. The faster speed and the removal of some frames of animation generally give the Super NES version a choppier feel. Audio-wise, there's quite some variation here. The Super NES soundtrack isn't half bad, but it sounds somewhat muffled, I think. Certain sound effects, such as picking up coins, also seem a little ill-fitting. What's up with that sound? The Genesis version, then, sounds a little dirty in comparison, but honestly, those filthy jungle beats work pretty well on the Yamaha audio chip included in the system. Oh, and the sound effects are a little more fitting as well. Lastly, there's the Sega CD version, which I feel is the best of the bunch by far. The Redbook audio tracks included with this game are superb. I just love the way this soundtrack sounds on Sega CD. It's just so rich and wonderful. One more thing about the visuals, though. The Genesis game was clearly designed with composite video output in mind. 
Blurring the image slightly, for instance, completely solves the dithering issues, producing smoother colors. This was kind of a common thing back in the day, and one of the reasons why dithering is so common on the system. It looks a lot better with composite video, though you lose the clarity you'd otherwise get with RGB. That said, on a real CRT, RGB still looks pretty good, but I think it holds up less well when viewed in this fashion. It's definitely not designed to be displayed on a flat panel. One last complaint here about the Super NES version though. These platforms here, they rely on a sound cue to indicate when they're going to fold in and out. Take a listen. There's a small scraping noise just before it folds in, giving the player enough time to react. Now, this is what it sounds like on Super NES. That small cue is missing, making these sections more difficult, especially with the camera which bounces back and forth due to the reduced field of view. Overall though, this initial release was pretty good. Both versions are solid, but I do kind of prefer the look and feel of the Genesis version, just by a hair. It's simply the more refined game, even if Super NES can appear superior in certain circumstances. The Super NES version is the one that feels like a port. But what about the Sega CD version? This, my friends, is my favorite version to pick up and play. At its core, it looks and plays identically to the Genesis version, but features Redbook audio tracks, which I mentioned earlier, a small introduction FMV sequence, and three new levels. Oh, and short loading times as well, unfortunately. The additional content, improved audio, and super smooth gameplay make for an amazing version of Pitfall the Mayan Adventure. But this was not the end. Within a year of release, Activision commissioned three new ports of the game for Atari Jaguar, Sega 32X, and Windows 95. And this is where things get supremely interesting. The order in which these conversions were made, though, remains a bit of a mystery due to limited documentation, but they all seem to draw upon the same improved artwork. Let's start with the 32X version then. Released in the fall of 1995, this version of Pitfall is based directly on the Genesis version of the game, but with some key changes. First and foremost, the only reason you'd release a game on 32X at this point is to draw upon the new hardware in some way, and Pitfall does offer an increased color palette for its foreground graphics. All the game's artwork has been reworked to make use of a broader color palette free from the limitations of the 16-bit consoles. And I think the results speak for themselves. The work done here is superb. Perhaps this more closely resembles the original background art created for the game during development. The parallax layer, however, is still handled entirely by the Genesis console, meaning that the original color palette limitations still apply, leading to a slightly mismatched overall appearance. The 32X version also includes additional stages from the Sega CD version, though it uses the Genesis soundtrack. So everything should be great, right? Well, as you've no doubt noticed, it's not. The frame rate is awful. Basically, the base frame rate is halved from 60 FPS of the original to just 30 frames per second, yet it can barely even hold that. The game drops to 20 FPS regularly, leading to a very choppy experience. What makes this even stranger is the mismatch between background and foreground. The Genesis-powered parallax background layer runs at 60 frames per second, while the foreground and sprites move at half rate or lower. There are even weird glitches from time to time, it just feels horrible in comparison. My guess is that this is the result of the 32X hardware itself. 32X draws graphics to dual alternating frame buffers and isn't designed specifically to accelerate sprites and tile maps in hardware. As a result, drawing all those pixels, even if it seems like a simple 2D game, is just too much for the poor 32X, and performance suffers. The hardware just isn't designed for games like Pitfall. This is perhaps one of the reasons why games like Knuckles Chaotix offload all background drawing to the Genesis hardware. It's the only way to achieve decent speed on this thing. So the 32X version is a disappointment then. It's vastly inferior to every other version thus far due to its low frame rate. But that artwork would not go unused. The other two 1995 releases also make use of it. First is the Windows 95 version, and this one has some pretty interesting history behind it. Pitfall the Mayan Adventure for Windows 95 is, from what I can tell, the very first commercial game designed specifically for Windows 95. 
Yep, this is the start of gaming on, well, somewhat modern Windows platforms. But it goes deeper. The conversion was developed by Keensoft Developments, the studio behind the Exodus video gaming technologies, something you may not have heard of. From what I've read, Exodus allows the team to use 486 assembler code for things like game logic while surrounding the game with a C++ shell. Thanks to Windows 95 direct access to hardware, this type of approach was now possible within the OS, and this is what was used with Pitfall. It just so happens that Exodus Tools kindled a relationship with Microsoft, leading to the development of something known as DirectX. Yep, DirectX 1.0 is the result of Keensoft and Microsoft working together to prepare Windows 95 for video games. And all that connects back to Pitfall the Mind Adventure for Windows 95. It's not only the first commercial game for the OS, but it's also connected to the creation of DirectX in some roundabout way, even if the game itself does not make use of DirectX. Pretty cool, huh? So how is the port then? Well, for the time, it was superb. This version combines the high color tile work from the 32X version with improved parallax background graphics while supporting smooth 60 frames per second frame rates even on mid-range PCs with a CD Redbook audio soundtrack. So you get the best of the Sega CD version combined with the best of the 32X, with further improvements even. You might be thinking then, what makes this so impressive, John? It's just a 2D game. Well, PCs of this era were not especially fast at drawing graphics in this style. Most consoles offered hardware designed specifically to accelerate tile maps and sprites. There were constraints there in terms of the palettes and the size of each tile, but it was extremely fast. The PC, however, needs to draw to a frame buffer, and graphics cards of this era were not well equipped for this. This method of rasterizing graphics did, however, enable much more freedom in terms of what could be drawn. By 1995, those CPUs and Visa local bus graphics cards were starting to reach the point where it could be feasible to deliver fast 2D graphics with lots of parallax layers if coded properly. Keensoft basically solved this issue and made it work under Windows 95. This should be the best version by far then, but there's an issue. It doesn't play nicely with modern PCs. There are ways around it, of course, but I found it supremely difficult to hit a stable 60 frames per second on any machine due to compatibility issues with its supported video modes. A Pentium PC from this era with Windows 95, however, should play super well with the game, but that's not something a lot of folks will have access to. Following its release, Keensoft continued to create console to PC conversions, including games such as Earthworm Jim, Gex, and Battle Arena Toshinden 2, among others. That just leaves us with the Atari Jaguar version, which is, in my opinion, the most disappointing version yet. So first, on the positive side, the Jag version looks great, featuring roughly the same artwork from the Windows 95 and 32X versions, with a few subtle changes. This is a beautiful version of Pitfall the Mine Adventure. One of the changes you might notice then is the background in this scene, for instance. The water reflection effect is rendered slightly differently on the Jag. The team also did a nice job translating the soundtrack to work on the Jaguar, which is not an easy task since the system lacks dedicated audio hardware. So thus far, it's not bad, right? This had the potential to be one of the best console versions of the game, but it falls short in one key area, performance. That's right, like the 32X version, the Jaguar targets 30 frames per second instead of 60. That said, performance is at least faster than the 32X version all around, hitting 30 FPS most of the time, with just a few dips and spikes here and there. For me though, it's really disappointing since the Jaguar should have been able to do better. If you can run a game like Rayman at 60 frames per second on this thing, you'd kind of expect the same with Pitfall. So this port was handled by Imagitech Design, a studio responsible for various other Jaguar releases during its lifespan. The Jaguar version of Raiden, for instance, was handled by Imagitech Design, and unfortunately, it also runs at half the frame rate, just like Pitfall. The thing is, the Jag itself has a lot of hardware bugs and issues to work around, which may account for some of the problems with this port. We don't know what kind of timetable the team had to work with either. Between the buggy development tools, buggy hardware, and a potentially short development schedule, it's easy to imagine a very compressed and difficult development cycle. 
Either way, the Jaguar version just isn't good enough and left me hugely disappointed despite not being the worst version of the game. It's too bad we never received an enhanced Jaguar CD version though. Once this version was on shelves though, Pitfall the Mine Adventure basically faded into obscurity for a while as the next generation of consoles took off. Of course, Pitfall itself didn't disappear. In 1998, Pitfall received another reboot of sorts, Pitfall 3D Beyond the Jungle for the Sony PlayStation. Pitfall Harry Returns, this time voiced by Bruce Campbell, and well, it's not very good. I mean, I like the concept, it's a pseudo free roaming 3D platformer with some elements of the Mayan adventure, but the low frame rate and stiff controls ultimately prevent the game from reaching its full potential. I certainly don't hate the game, but it is not a worthy follow up to the Mayan adventure. Curiously, two developers who worked on the game, Francois-Yves Bertrand and Jeff Buchanan, both contributed to the development of Virtua Fighter with AM2. These guys know their stuff, so I'm a little surprised that the game ended up like this. Though to be fair, with a higher frame rate and proper analog controls, it actually could have been a pretty fun little game. Then three years later in 2001, Pitfall the Mayan Adventure returned for one last go around with a brand new port to Nintendo's new Game Boy Advance system. And it's kind of a train wreck. Yep, this is, in my book, the single worst version of Pitfall to date. It's a terrible port brought to you by Majesco and I feel it represents the worst of Super NES to GBA porting that we would see during the lifespan of GBA. So where do I begin? Well firstly, it was designed specifically for the original Game Boy Advance, the non-backlit version. As a result, the color palette has been changed to accommodate this screen, resulting in a horribly washed out, ugly version of the game on anything other than an original GBA. It's a hideous mishmash of garish colors. This version is derived from the Super NES version by the way, but GBA has an even lower screen resolution than Super NES leading to a very small playfield, which makes the game even more difficult to play. Then there's the audio, or well, the lack thereof. You see the music has been completely stripped out and the sound effects are just awful. This is one of the worst sounding games I've played on GBA. Even the pitch of Harry's voice is wrong. Whoa. It's really awful stuff. Lastly, the frame rate is kinda sluggish compared to Super NES. It does at least target 60 frames per second, which is nice, but the GBA struggles to maintain it, and the whole game just feels a little bit choppy. And this is true for the package as a whole, it just feels glitchy and unfinished, almost as if they published an early alpha build of the game rather than a final release, and it's terrible. And it's a shame that this would be the last official port of the Mayan Adventure, as I feel it kind of tainted the memories that people had of the original release. Now, the Mayan Adventure did show up later on Virtual Console, but that's about it. So at this point then, we've seen seven different versions of the Mayan Adventure, but only half of them are genuinely good. Despite that, I still love the game. It's one of those platformers I enjoy replaying on a regular basis. It's just short enough to make revisiting it a snap. Also, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, the Mayan Adventure even includes the original Pitfall as a bonus game, which I think is a pretty neat little treat, especially for 1994. This was, of course, not the end for the Pitfall series. A few years later, Activision released Pitfall The Lost Expedition for multiple consoles, and honestly, it's a huge improvement from Pitfall 3D. It has a playful spirit, delivers a mostly smooth 60 frames per second, and features snappy controls with level design that draws from the series as a whole. The animation is very fluid, and it really holds up better than you would have expected. Now I don't prefer it to the Mayan Adventure by any means, but it's worth checking out today if you can find a copy. But that, my friends, marks the end of our journey, and the end of Pitfall as we know it. As a franchise, Pitfall was key to Activision both in its initial form in the early 80s and during its rebirth in the mid 90s. It may not be a series you think about often today, but it's one that should never be forgotten. And while the Mayan Adventure itself may not hold the same legendary status as the original, I feel it's become an overlooked gem that feels as fresh today as it did in 94. So check it out. But with that, we've reached the end of another episode. 
Thanks for joining me on this crazy ride through the history of Pitfall the Mine Adventure. It may not be a series you'd expect to find on this channel, but that's just how DF Retro rolls. If you enjoyed this episode though, be sure to let us know by liking, subscribing, ringing the notification bell, and following me over on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.